It is now time to celebrate the golden anniversary of what historians have called the Bill of the Century, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Before my questions of Linda Johnson Robb and Larry Temple begin, let's listen to the voices of the two most important leaders of the American Civil Rights Movement, President Lyndon Johnson and Martin Luther King Jr., in a phone conversation they had shortly after the Kennedy assassination. Uh, interest in your cooperation and your uh, communication, and a good many people told me that they uh, Heard about your statement, I guess, on TV, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. Uh, I, uh -huh. I, I've been locked up in this office and I haven't seen it, but I won't tell you how grateful I am and how, uh, how worthy I'm going to try to be of all your hopes. Well, thank you very much. I'm so happy to hear that, and I knew that you had just that great spirit, and you know you have our support and backing. Well, because we know what a difficult period this is. It's a, it's a, just an impossible period. We've got a budget coming up that's we got nothing to do with. It's practically already made, and we've got a civil rights bill that hadn't even passed the House, and it's November, and Hubert Humphrey told me yesterday everybody wanted to go home. We've got a tax bill that they haven't touched, and we just uh, got to let up, not let up on any of them and keep going, and I guess they'll say that I'm repudiated, but I'm going to ask the Congress Wednesday to just stay there they pass them all. They won't do it, but we'll just keep them there next year till they do, and we just won't give up an inch. Uh huh. Well, this is this is mighty fine. I think it's uh, it's so imperative. I think one of the great uh, tributes that we can pay in memory of President Kennedy is to try to enact some of the great uh, progressive policies that he sought to initiate. Well, I'm going to support them all, and you can count on that, and I'm going to do my best to get other men to do likewise, and I'll have to have y'all's help. I well, never needed more than I do now. Well, you know you have it, and just feel free to call on us for anything. Thank you so much, Mark. All right. Call me when you... Uh, call, I sure will. Call me when you're down here next time. I certainly will. But let's get together, and, and any suggestions you got, bring them in. Fine. I certainly will do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> much has been said about the difference in the approaches to addressing the battle for civil rights between Presidents Kennedy and Johnson during their time in the Oval Office. Robert Carroll begins his newest biography of LBJ, The Passage of Power, with the observation that at the time of Kennedy's death, every major administration bill before Congress, including the Civil Rights Act, was stalled. Roy Wilkins, head of the NAACP in the 1960s, said, John Kennedy didn't really know what was possible in Congress. Lyndon Johnson knew exactly what was possible. Richard Revere, in a December 1964 article in The New Yorker, said that President Kennedy's eloquence made people think. President Johnson's hammer blows made people act. Today, to discuss the Bill of the Century, we're honored to have with us two people who know the Civil Rights Act's wheel horse, Lyndon Johnson, better than anyone else who is still with us and active in preserving the legacy of Lyndon Johnson. And now they're going to share their thoughts about the Civil Rights Act leader who stands at the top of the American history's mountain in the field of civil rights in 2014. Linda, let's start by going back to November 22, 1963. Your dad began that day as vice president, his least favorite position during his political career, a job he once described as being like a Texas steer in that he's lost his social standing in the society where he resides. But on that November afternoon, he became president, the world's most powerful man, and he responded by assuming his responsibilities flawlessly. You were 20 years old at the time, a student at the University of Texas at Austin. Give us a daughter's perspective on the transformation that you think took place inside your father on November 22nd and the days thereafter, 
as he left behind his bum steer job of vice president and rose to the occasion in leading the country after the Kennedy assassination. Well, Talmadge has asked me to do something that obviously um, I'm not capable of doing. Nobody could understand Lyndon Johnson's mind. <laughs> and I would be the very last person to try to speak for him. Um, <laughs> thunderbolts, but uh, nor would, I might add, Larry Temple. Um, but I think he recognized that here was the opportunity to get a lot of legislation through in, in memory of President Kennedy. And, you know, it's important to know uh, what to work for, but it's also important to, work, to look and say, when can it be possible? And uh, the Civil Rights Bill had been stalled. Uh, Daddy had spoken uh, in Gettysburg of uh, that August and talked about the need to make the Emancipation Proclamation a reality and not just a phrase. And it was a very, very strong speech. But you, you understand in Texas the politics of this. And there was a lot of concern with some people, not so much Daddy, but some people, that, wait a minute, maybe we want to start working on this in the beginning of 65, after we get reelected. But Daddy knew that this was the time when we had a window of opportunity. And so he, that very night of the 22nd, and in, as you heard, um, not very well, the, um, uh, telephone conversation, he really wanted to seize the moment and the hearts of the people in this country to see that this was something that we needed to do now, that in memory of President Kennedy, let's work on making this a more just country. And that's why he called Martin Luther King, but he called everybody. He recognized that this was not something that he alone was going to be able to do, and he needed the Republicans, he needed the uh, religious leaders, he needed uh, every constituency to try together to push this through, and now was the time, not after an election, but right now when it could have the most impact. And he started right then in November, and with the help of a lot of people, he got it through. Now, we want to recognize, as wonderful as Daddy was, and as marvelous as Dr. King was, there were a lot of people, maybe not as rich as y'all, <laughs> but there were a lot of people out there in the hinterland who were really putting their lives on the line not only um, the African Americans and, and, uh, uh, and white people all across this world, this country anyway, but they were, if, if it wasn't just their physical life, it was really uh, their, their uh, life, their employment, because some of those people who came to meet us at train stations, some of those people who who marched, they knew that people in church, some of them weren't going to like them anymore. Some of them are going to, you're going to have some of those people who say, no, no, I'm not going to buy anything from your store. And so it was not just daddy, it was a groundswell of people all over uh, the United States who recognized that we needed to make a change and we wanted to do it as with as little bloodshed as possible. And it was a revolution of, of not with, uh, with spears, but in boats. Mm -hmm. Now, Larry, uh, Lyndon Johnson traveled a civil rights odyssey from 1937 when he came to D.C. as a congressman through 1964. His voting record in Congress before 1957 
matched up with his mentor, Senator Richard Russell, a Southern segregationist, meaning that in his first 20 years in Washington, LBJ voted against all the civil rights bills. However, upon gaining some power as Senate Majority Leader in 1957, he pushed through the first civil rights bill since 1875 over Richard Russell's objection, though it was a weak law and had little effect on Jim Crow. Then, when Lyndon Johnson became president in late 1963, as Linda has just mentioned, he had maximum power. He broke the legislative log jam that was holding up the Civil Rights Bill, got the bill out of committee onto the floors of Congress, and voted into law. Give us your perspective on, on Lyndon Johnson's Civil War journey from 1937 through 1964 that culminated in his Oval Office accomplishments. Well, I'm like uh, Lyndon. Nobody knows what was in his mind. Uh, and why he did uh, what he did, or why he didn't do what he didn't do. Uh, but Lyndon Johnson was the ultimate pragmatist. Uh, he was one that uh, looked at the real facts and uh, dealt with the uh, facts as they occurred to him. Uh, and I, I think he didn't do anything earlier because he didn't have the clout. And the time wasn't right. When he was in the Congress, uh, he was a junior member of the House. When he was initially in the Senate, obviously everybody is a junior member of the Senate when they come into the Senate. And he simply did not have the political muscle or the political clout uh, to do what he might otherwise want to do. He obviously did have that clout when he became majority leader in 1957. If you hear what he said, when he talked about civil rights in the 1960s, the genesis of his view about civil rights uh, originated in Catula, Texas, uh, where he taught in a one-room school uh, to a group of Mexican-American children, uh, and he saw, as he said, in their eyes, the hunger they came to school with, the deprivation that they had, and he always wanted to do something about that. I'm satisfied he wanted to do it in 1937, in 1945, 1951, but he simply didn't have the political muscle to do it. The timing wasn't right, uh, but when the time was right and he did have that uh, political strength, he took advantage of it, 57, 64, 65, 68, uh, and I think that's what occurred. And just an addendum to that, he was um, a uh, one of only three Southerners who voted against the Southern Manifesto. He refused to sign it, and um, so. He had a famous saying, he said, you don't try to kill the snake until you got the hoe in your hands. And it wasn't until he became president that they had the hoe in the hands. Now, Linda, you grew up in Virginia, where your dad was in Congress during your growing up years, where Senator Richard Russell, a confirmed bachelor, was your family's frequent house guest. I read that you affectionately called him Uncle Dick and once said that he helped raise you. What was it like in 1964 knowing your dad was going head to head with his longtime friend and mentor, your Uncle Dick, who was his biggest obstacle to getting the Civil Rights Bill passed? First, you have to understand these were different times. Uh, Daddy knew every member of the Senate, and he uh, was friends with most of them. Uh, he might not have voted the way they did, he might not have agreed with all of their policies, but there was a time when people actually talked to each other in Congress, across party lines. You would eat with them. Yeah. You know, we say that there were three things that, that ruined Congress. One was air conditioning. Um, well, you know, it was, you got a lot more work for your money in those days. They would come to Washington in, in uh, January. You'd continue through the, the 
the year. And then everybody would go home in about um, July, maybe. And they'd do all your constituent services at home and everything. And then you'd come back again. You didn't just spend two days a week in Washington. And um, so we really knew each other. And we loved Dick Russell. He was daddy's um, sponsor in the Senate. He was his uh, mentor. And it's very hard to go against somebody that you love. But daddy recognized that this was something that had to change. And this was the time. And he talked to Dick Russell about it. And he basically says, I'm going to pass this bill, and if I if I have to run you over, I'm going to do it. Now, I want you all to know, Dick Russell was not a mean, nasty racist. He was a man who was, built, who was born in a different time. And when this bill came along, it was just too late to, to try to change the way he had been, as they say in that song, carefully taught. But when he lost that battle, when Dick Russell was defeated, the man who walked him back to his office was Clarence Mitchell, who was the lobbyist for the NAACP. And Dick Russell said, wouldn't the outcome that he would have wanted, but it was the law of the land now. And he said, and we're going to follow it. Now to follow that up, I read that when Clarence Mitchell passed away, you gave the eulogy at his funeral. I did. I did give the eulogy. He was a wonderful man. In those days, I grew up, my um, um, experience in, in the summers and after school, going up to the Senate office building and helping. You know, I folded mail. I was very important. I got asked to take constituents around. I mean, I was an important part of this whole operation. <laughs> and, and so I knew the senators then better than I knew them when Chuck was a senator. I mean, I knew where, they, uh, where their offices were, and I just went around and visited, and Lucy and I, you know, we didn't think anything about it. We loved it. Now, let me add, uh, elaborate on something that uh, Linda said, because I think it's really uh, relevant and, and insightful about uh, Linda Johnson. Those of you that may have seen the uh, play on Broadway, All the Way, which is about the 64 Civil Rights Act, uh, may have left that play wondering, uh, was Linda Johnson for civil rights because he deeply believed in it, or was he for civil rights because uh, he thought he needed that for re-election in 64? And, and that, that question uh, has been posed on many occasions, and there was the meeting that Linda talked about. It's recorded by Jack Bellini, who was there, in Jack's book, where Jack says that uh, it was Jack Bellini, Linda Johnson, and Richard Russell. And uh, Linda Johnson said, Dick, I love you and I owe you, but I'm going to pass this civil rights bill. If I've got to run over you to do it, I'm going to run over you to do it. But I'm going to pass it and we're going to pass all of it. We're not going to pull pieces out. We're not going to pass part of it. We're going to pass the whole thing. And I just want you to know I'm going to do that if I've got to run over you. And apparently there was a pause and R Richard Russell said, Mr. President, you very well may be able to do that. But I'm here to tell you that if you do that, you will lose the South and you'll lose the election this year. To which Lyndon Johnson said, Dick, if that's the price I have to pay to pass this legislation, I will gladly pay it. That one conversation tells you why and how Lyndon Johnson was committed to the civil rights law. And he knew that that civil rights law wasn't going to help him a bit in the South. And those were some of the people who had been his biggest supporters. Um, so he did it, uh, he knew what he was going in for. And he knew that the time was right. And uh, there's an interesting piece um, uh, I recently read 
and I'm not sure if this was in Georgia or where it was, but it was in the South, and it was, <coughs> excuse me, the person who was telling the story said that there was a young um, military officer, and uh, he just moved into this southern town with his family, and he went to um, the hamburger um, joint to get something to eat, and came up to the to the desk and he said how many hamburgers he wanted. And uh, the person serving him said, I don't understand this. He said, really, I'm, I'm from New Jersey, but I tell you, if you come around back, I'll get you the hamburgers. And the young officer said, I'm not that hungry. And the Civil Rights Act was passed. And the next day he went back to to this place, the hamburger joint, and he was served. And that young serviceman was Colin Powell. Mm -hmm. So uh, the answer is that they were a lot of places in the South that once that law was passed, as Dick Russell said, it's the law now, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna follow it. Now in 2014, we don't seem to have anybody capable in Washington in getting legislation passed. And nobody could do that like Lyndon Johnson. No one was as equal. No one could horse trade like Lyndon Johnson. No one could go for his adversary's jugular like LBJ. No one knew how to seize the moment with perfect timing like LBJ. And he proved this first as Senate Majority Leader and then as President. So Larry, give us your perspective on Lyndon Johnson's unique ability to get legislation passed. Well, he grew up in the Congress. Uh, he was in the House and in the Senate, and, and he did understand uh, both houses of Congress. And I think all of the historians will tell you of uh, the presidents we've had, the 44 now, uh, that we've had, no one understood the Congress uh, and worked with Congress uh, better than Lyndon Johnson. And as I say, that, that's where he got to his uh, beginning. And I think what he did, he understood what would motivate uh, a particular member of Congress. It may be that the member of Congress uh, wanted uh, help in getting appropriation for a dam in uh, their district, and he'd help get the appropriation of the dam. It might be that uh, a member of the Senate had somebody uh, that he or she wanted appointed uh, to a judicial position, and LBJ would see if, if that could be done or maybe expedited. Uh, and uh, there, sometimes it was a threat. Uh, if you don't do that, then uh, you're not gonna get my help on X. Uh, and sometimes it was the soft approach of, uh, you really need to do that for your country. You know, there's a very famous uh, story, I don't know whether it's apocryphal or uh, true, but uh, I love it. Uh, Everett Dirksen was the Republican leader in the Senate, and in order to get uh, Dirksen to uh, be very active for the 64 Civil Rights Act, uh, he was telling him about his place in history, and he said, you know, Eb, you get out front on this, and a hundred years from now, a hundred years from now, School kids will only know two names when it comes to civil rights, Abraham Lincoln and Everett Dirksen. <laughs> and Dirksen wasn't totally dumb, uh, but I was around several times when he and Dirksen and President Dirksen were together, and there was enough vanity and ego there that he thought, well, maybe that just might be true. Uh, and so uh, he did that. And the, the one thing, uh, if you uh, watch through the years, Lyndon Johnson, uh, he took advantage of uh, circumstances, knowing when uh, the circumstances in the country uh, led the country to want to take action or would uh, cause the Congress to take action. And think about it just a minute. He had three civil rights bills that he passed as president. The 64 Civil Rights Bill uh, that we are talking about today uh, was after the assassination of President Kennedy, and he said, we need to do this to honor our fallen president. Well, go back and look at that civil rights bill. Uh, it, was, it started being the civil rights bill that President Kennedy wanted, 
but it was expanded to do all the things LBJ wanted, and yet he called it Kennedy's bill, always. This is the President Kennedy's bill that we've got to pass. So he took advantage of the grief in this country to pass that legislation. And then the next step was to try to get the voting rights uh, legislation passed and couldn't get it done. It was stalled. And uh, in March of 1965, what became known as Bloody Sunday, there was a group of African Americans in a peaceful march from Selma to Montgomery. Uh, and as they crossed the Pettus Bridge, and Congressman John Lewis, who's one of the great war horses still in the Congress today, was there as a young man. As they crossed the Pettus Bridge, they were met by the local police with guns, with fire hoses, with dogs, with batons, and literally got beat up. But what the law enforcement people didn't realize is that was on television. It was being beamed to this country on television, and people were upset, and that's when Lyndon Johnson said all they wanted to do was to register people and give them the right to vote. Now we've got to pass the Voting Rights Act. And that got passed, in part, not solely, but in part, because of the uh, circumstances in the country. And then in 1968, uh, the president wanted to pass uh, the Fair Housing Act, and I remember being there, and, and it, it was stalled. It was just there in the Congress, wasn't moving. Uh, and the Fair Housing Act said no discrimination in the buying and selling of housing and the financing of housing, uh, in the rental of housing. Uh, and when that was stalled and he couldn't do anything, he waited until the right time and Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Uh, and the next day, the next day after Dr. King's assassination, the president said, we can move now and we're gonna move now. And he got the Fair Housing Act passed. So a part of the, the legislative genius, and it was legislative genius, plainly and simply, was that he knew and understood the people with whom he was dealing and he dealt with them with civility uh, and uh, understanding and help and he knew the Congress and knew how to work with them, but he also knew when, where, how to uh, move and, and act and react. And he also was a friend of so many of those people, even the ones that he differed from uh, on voting. And it was interesting, um, since I have lived in Virginia now, going on 50 years, with my husband Chuck, who's here, uh, who's a lawyer, I must say I have paid for two lawyers and I haven't gotten a bit out of either one of them legally. <laughs> a lot of good things about them, but <laughs> anyway. Um, but but um, um, Senator Byrd of Virginia, who was very important in, in uh, Daddy's time. And, when Daddy was president, he, he got Senator Byrd to vote on a bill that was supported by labor. And someone said, uh, why? Why did you vote for that bill? Why did you let Lyndon Johnson get that bill out of committee? And he said, when my niece died, there was a terrible snowstorm. Lyndon Johnson is the only person who came to her funeral, the only member of the Senate who came to her funeral. So we all have to recognize that having friendships across party lines, knowing people, caring about them, that makes a big difference too. And that was something that, that Daddy knew and, and that he, he uh, used it to his best advantage. And he was there for them, and they were there for him when he needed it. And um, in the Civil Rights Bill, he purposely crossed and, and urged everybody, Republicans, to vote for it. Because he also recognized that if you passed a bill with Democrats and Republicans voting for it, you're much more likely to get this bill not just passed, but really to have it be effective all over this country. And in every, everybody had kind of bought into it. And 
they were only six Republicans, I think it's six, who didn't vote for the Civil Rights Bill. One of them, of course, was Senator Tower. Um, one of them was Barry Goldwater. Um, but the majority of the Republicans voted for that bill, and we wouldn't have had it without them. And they were a lot of Republican heroes, a lot of Republicans. And imagine a Democratic president saying, giving the first pen to, to the Republican leader. But Daddy knew that all of those people also had put their political lives on the line, and that there were a few people in Peoria who were not going to be happy about his Dirksen's vote and, and big support. And, and that's part of it, too. I think that's a very important part of uh, knowing uh, people around him. Daddy had a great advantage at that. Mm -hmm. Now, Linda, it, it's been said that your father's expertise in the science of politics came because he was a reader of men, not of books. Hubert Humphrey said he was, quote, like a psychiatrist in the way he sized people up and could look into a man's heart and know his innermost worries and desires. Give us your perspective on those descriptions of your father. Well, I think that's very true. And it's, every, well, those interested in this subject, you know, I'm very interested in this year, I've become more interested, I have become more educated. Um, you know, believe it or not, they did not pass the law with all of my, um, you know, I was not behind the scenes pulling all the strings. I was 20 years old and I had other things on my mind. Uh, but he did, he tried to get everybody to live up to the best in them, to appeal first, his first choice was to appeal to their hearts. And if you listen to the conversations with George Wallace, for instance, um, he said, Governor Wallace, you started off as a populist. Remember, you came into government to help the little man. And do you want on your tombstone for it to say, I built schools? Or do you want to have it say? Um, I hated. Yeah. He, he said, "Do you want it on your tombstone?" I hated, uh, and and I think that resonated with uh, uh, George Wallace. But uh, he still was pretty intransigent. Yes, but he did ask. Uh, it, Daddy knew how much viscerally. The South hated what happened to them in Reconstruction, and the South, and the Union troops coming down. And so um, uh, he wasn't going to send the federal troops in without being asked. And so he did. He appealed to George Wallace, um, and uh, that's why uh, George Wallace uh, asked him to bring in troops to, uh, so when Martin Luther King marched across the Pettus Bridge, nobody was hit with any batons. Uh, and it was a very successful, nonviolent uh, march. But he got George Wallace to ask him, so it was not uh, the president sending troops down to him to do this. And he knew people's hearts. Uh, or he, he appealed to people's hearts first. Now, Larry, let's go a little deeper. Are, are there any characteristics about Lyndon Johnson that you think most people don't know or don't appreciate that came into play in getting the Civil Rights Act passed? Well, I wasn't there in 64, so I really can't uh, say about that. but. Uh, I think uh, Linda probably has put her uh, finger on it. I think the thing that uh, 
people have a perception of Lyndon Johnson about is this uh, big, tough, demanding, overpowering uh, person who uh, would either threaten somebody or grab them by the lapels and uh, talk to them. And, and it was, it was effective. Uh, when he got somebody, he would get right in their face and they, 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 he would have his nose within three or four inches of their nose and at six foot four, he'd be looking down and they'd be looking up and if you can imagine that situation, I've been in that situation. I know what that uh, <laughs> uh, does. Uh, did he do that? Yes. But there was a softness to LBJ that I think has uh, never been fully understood. Uh, this uh, attending uh, Senator Byrd's niece's funeral, that, that uh, quintessentially was LBJ. Uh, he remembered uh, when somebody had problems, when there was a uh, death in the family, when there was illness in the family, uh, and he got people to vote for him, just like uh, Senator Byrd, not by what he did in connection with that vote, but by what he had done over a period of uh, a lifetime of the relationship uh, between the two. Uh, and uh, he could be uh, very soft and very caring, and I know that uh, around the White House, uh, he was always looking uh, to do something nice for somebody. Uh, if I had been working uh, probably 15, 16 hours a day uh, for multiple weeks, he would uh, tell me to bring my wife to the uh, White House for lunch and he'd bring her into the Oval Office and give her something, give her a, a chain or a pin or a, uh, some uh, token. And he was very, very thoughtful and considerate to everybody uh, and I think that's a part of uh, the genius, as I say. He did that over a long period of time, and then he was able to encourage people to be uh, reciprocal uh, in doing something for him at a time that he wanted legislation. And, and I say for him, uh, you know, the, 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 you can find, if you listen to all the telephone tapes, if you want to, this will be a little advertisement, go to the LBJ library and in the exhibits throughout the library, there are about 90 separate telephone tapes, and you don't have to hear Linda Robb or Larry Temple tell you about Linda Johnson. You hear Linda Johnson tell you about Linda Johnson, and you'll hear multiple times him saying, well, this isn't uh, the uh, president asking you to do this. This is not Lyndon Johnson asking you to do this. This is your country asking you to do this. And, so he would uh, put it on that kind of a basis, and people, people did respond. Now, Linda, in your opening remarks, you referenced this, but immediately after the Civil Rights Act was signed into law on July 2, 1964, you and your sister Lucy joined your mother on a 19-car train called, the press called, the Lady Bird Special, that traveled from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans and made 47 stops in eight states. How did Southerners react to the Lady Bird Special's journey in the immediate aftermath of the passage of the Civil Rights Act in July 1964? Well, Mother particularly wanted the people of the South to know that we loved them and Mother said, uh, you may not like what I'm saying, but you'll understand the, what, my voice when I'm saying it. And there was a lot to that. She uh, grew up in East Texas, deep East Texas, and she had lots of relatives in, in Alabama and throughout the South. And so we tapped into all of those relatives. You can be sure they all got to come to the train station. But we took along with us um, a lot of very nice, respectable women on the train with us. And um, not too long ago, I was speaking to the, uh, one of the ladies who had been on the train. And she was a little older than I was. So, you know. uh, and I asked her, I said, you know, your, your father is a senator from the deep south. What did he think about it? about you riding on that train going through the South. And she said, oh, Linda, he loved your daddy so much, he understood. 
And I think there was a lot to that. I think there were a lot of people in the South who recognized that even though they didn't like it and they didn't want it, that it was going to happen. And they could be ugly and mean about it, or they could just accept it and understand that times were changing. Um, but before we went into this trip, Mother called the senators and the governors of all the states we were going through and just said, I just want you to know I'm coming down. I didn't want to come into your state without letting you know and without telling you I'm coming. And we'd love to have you come and ride through the state with us on the train. And we'd love to have you meet us when we come to Richmond or whatever. And it was very interesting. When Chuck was governor, I had some of the, um, well, I had all of the uh, governors and spouses come to governor's mansion. And so the ladies, we gathered around and we all told stories about what it was like. And um, uh, the Godwins, uh, Governor Godwin was the governor uh, in uh, was running, actually, he would, in Virginia, you know, we do everything differently. So we have off-year elections, because we're not going to be influenced by the federal government. <laughs> Senator Byrd made that the way it was. So um, we came, daddy, daddy, mother called, and the, the governor, the sitting governor, he didn't really want to come to the train station, so he sent his lieutenant governor, and uh, that was part of the bird machine, just you had your, where you were. So um, he sent the, uh, the lieutenant governor to meet us in Richmond, and this was Mills Godwin. And he told me, he said, I never would have been elected governor, I never would have been elected governor if I hadn't come to meet you at the train station. Now he was a Democrat. And he'd been a good, good governor, good on education particularly. Um, but he said, I knew that if I, uh, if I hadn't come, that the moderates, let's not use that bad word of liberal, the liberals in the Democratic Party in Virginia would have opposed me in the primary and I wouldn't have been elected governor. And so he recognized just that gesture and what a difference it made. But we went through a lot of states, and I, first there were bomb threats. And the biggest scare for me was not even the bomb threat. We sent a, a car through ahead of us and hoped, you know, if there was a bomb on the train, on the bridge tracks, that it would take, the, take this little push cart through or whatever. But the worry was, that you were going to have the people in these towns so polarized that you would get the African Americans and the uh, supporters of the civil rights movement on one side, and then you would have the very anti, and that maybe they would get into a fight, and that would be the story. And in some places when we went through, we would have people who would say, down with the blackbird, and, and many, many uh, other things that were not near as nice about us doing this. And we, we really worried about what might happen to uh, if, if these two groups clashed. And in some places, it was very, um, very violent, uh, at least in the speeches. And mother would have all of her dignity, and she would say, all right, you've had your opportunity to speak, now let me have mine. And just her demeanor um, carried the day. And, and so the, the people who opposed us quieted down a bit, and um, she would get to speak. But they were places where they would uh, deny us the use of, of the facilities in the area. Um, you couldn't, uh, you know, you had to really stay close to, 
to the train, and and um, it was it was a it was an interesting, scary time. But I tell you, there were a lot of very brave men, um, members of, of of the Democratic Party, uh, who came out to meet us, and. Um, we were lucky all around. We had good people uh, of religious, uh, very good religious leaders who supported it and came out to meet us. We had um, um, a lot of, of people who in their hearts, um, white people who came and were willing to put their names on the line too, and and risk everything, at least um, their livelihoods. So it was an exciting time, and I think we felt that we could really make a difference in this country, and we did make a difference. And you know, it's one of the things about having anniversaries, like 50th anniversary of just about everything in the next two or three years. Um, you you hear so many wonderful stories about people you never knew about. And recently, since I can, I'm saying this since we're at a judicial meeting, that's the nexus, as Chuck would say. <laughs> but um, there was a story in the paper about the Job Corps. And y'all all know, of course, about George Foreman being a Job Corps um, person. And when he won his, his um, belt, he sent it to daddy because he recognized that the Job Corps gave him this opportunity to be uh, a great fighter and of course now sell barbecue equipment to everybody. <laughs> but, um, but somebody wrote in and this person wrote in and said, I'm the man that you're talking about in the story about the Job Corps. And this person said that he didn't have the financial, uh, I mean, his parents didn't support him like he needed to. And he, at 16, went into the Job Corps. And he said, I got my GED in the Job Corps. And then I went on to college, and I got my law degree. And I'm now the chief judge of Idaho. So. You learn about this. And when my Catherine was doing a triathlon in Idaho, she talked to the judge. So some of y'all out there may have been affected by some of those laws of, that were passed in the 60s. It, um, we all benefited. Yeah. And I, being on Medicare, I'm very pleased. <laughs> Larry, Larry, let's close with your observation as the chairman of the Lyndon Baines Johnson Foundation of where President Johnson's legacy is today as our presidential champion of civil rights, do you believe it has confirmed once and for all that it was President Lyndon Johnson more than anyone else who succeeded in getting the American civil rights heroic effort codified into the books of law? Well, I don't think there's any question about it, and it's not just my opinion. My opinion is biased, and I acknowledge that it is. Uh, but we had uh, at the LBJ Library in April what we call the Civil Rights Summit, uh, and it really was to recognize the 50th anniversary of the passage of the 64 Civil Rights Act, but broader than that, uh, all three planks of the uh, civil rights legislation uh, the 64 Act, the 65 Voting Rights Act, the 68 Fair Housing Act. And we had all of the great leaders uh, of the civil rights movement of the 60s uh, here. Uh, John Lewis that I mentioned earlier, and uh, those of you who don't know about John Lewis, what a remarkable, remarkable human being he is. He, he at 22 or three, uh, literally got beat up and almost got killed on that bloody Sunday. And now he's one of the great distinguished members of the Congress. Uh, and Andrew Young, and just a myriad of other people that were here, and each and all of them, each and all of them said that uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, is the civil rights president. We would not uh, have had the uh, 
uh, advancements in civil rights had it not been for Lyndon Johnson. But then you, we had uh, four people uh, that uh, come with a good bit of credibility. Uh, on Tuesday night of the summit, uh, President Jimmy Carter came. On Wednesday night of the summit, uh, President Bill Clinton came. At noon on Thursday, uh, President Obama came. And on Thursday night, President George W. Bush. Now, the missing one in that group is uh, President George H.W. Bush, who was invited, who wanted to come, uh, and just physically uh, didn't feel like he was up to it, but asked to have his name attached to the summit and said, can I be an honorary co-chairman of your uh, summit? So we had uh, five presidents involved, and all four of the presidents that came here said, uh, and President Obama said repeatedly, maybe a, a dozen or 15 times, Lyndon Johnson uh, is uh, civil rights. He is the one, and uh, history will say that 100 years from now, 200 years from now, and I think there's absolutely uh, no doubt about it. Uh, and as I say, my biased opinion is uh, there, but uh, we've got some pretty good objective opinions that come to the same conclusion. Linda has something she wants to read to us to close the program. In our family, we have a, a motto, lose your breath, lose your turn. You know, we all just talk over each other. But, you know, as President Reagan says, my mic. So um, I'd just like to finish up. One of the things that Daddy also recognized, though, and the first papers that were open at the library were the civil rights papers. And we had a big meeting then. And it was in um, December. And it was cold out. And Daddy was having heart trouble. And his doctor told him he could not come to the opening of the summit. And he said, if you do that, you might die. And Daddy just said, well, <laughs> what better way to go? And um, he reminded us that um, uh, justice, the fight for equal status and justice was never ending. But he concluded that if our hearts are right and if courage remains our constant companion, then my fellow Americans, I am confident we shall overcome. And these battles, we're fighting some of them, same thing, 50 years later. And it's not up to those members of Congress alone or the president. It's up to every one of us to make sure that those things that we did in the 60s, that belief that we all had an obligation to help every person live up to the best that God gave them. Those have to be our goals and not just the goals of uh, the politicians, although I must say I certainly have gotten involved in it for too many years. <laughs> Thank you for letting us come and talk to you about it, and I hope that you will go out strengthened to work to make this a better country. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Very good. Wonderful.